Good afternoon and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's uh, ARTIG webinar on creating real-time information. Um, this is being recorded and we'll make it available um, through our YouTube channel uh, afterwards and we'll send you the link to that uh, if you uh, registered uh, on Eventbrite with us. Um, there are opportunity for questions. Please feel free to put them in the chat as we go along, and we'll pick them up at the end. Or um, we can uh, we'll we'll take uh, verbal questions uh, at the appropriate time. So uh, this afternoon um, we're going to look at um, why are predictions important. Um, and uh, what are they all about? How do you go about creating them? Um, and um, we're going to find out about uh, Bus Open Data Program and how you can access some of the data sets that are now available and then um, find out about how you should actually use the uh, the the, the BODS data that's available, uh, which are the important key fields um, to be able to create real-time predictions. Um, and then, uh, as I say, we'll have uh, question time uh, at the end. Um, we're doing this session today because um, BUS Open Data Programme has launched. There's now more um, public transport information, both scheduled and um, live than ever before and it's more easily available um, and we're seeing an increased um, interest in um, how people can can use this bus data to uh, to, to provide information to customers so um, why are predictions important um, in a recent um, transport focus um, study um, back from uh, September last year. Um, they identified 10 uh, passenger priorities um, and, uh, and a fair few of those involved um, predictions, either uh, up front to the customers or um, behind the scenes for operational. So everything from more buses on time at the stop if you can predict, then you can um, change your schedules to, to reflect road conditions, um, something that's uh, particularly challenging at the moment with varying traffic um, flows and demand. Um, more bus journeys on time, um, faster journey times. So if we can predict when a bus is going to be at a uh, set of traffic lights, the uh, traffic managers might be able to do something about that and stop the bus having to um, be delayed by a red signal. Um, more bus stops with next bus displays. Key obvious use for uh, predictions and, and predicting when a bus is going to arrive at the stop. Um, better quality of information at bus stops. How do we make this more accurate? Um, how do we improve the quality of predictions? Um, and there are a number uh, of others below the uh, the top ten. Um, there was also a uh, a recent uh, report from Transport for London uh, on their digital bus innovations, um, and customers were really prioritising two sorts of information that they need, either when they're at a bus stop or when they're on the bus, uh, they want to know when their bus is coming um, and then how long is the journey going to take. Both fundamentally need some form of um, prediction because uh, we all know that whatever you do, however careful you are with your timetables, um, they are always going to be subject to, uh, to a few uh, changes in reality um, on the street. So um, 
predictions are um, key across um, for customers, but also for um, operating your fleets if you're a bus operator. Um, so you know whether you need to intervene to speed up a bus or slow it down to manage headway or whether you're uh, not being able to meet the schedules um, at the moment and so you might need to tweak a timetable. Uh, that always used to be the journey's taking longer because there's more congestion. Uh, more recently it's been uh, help. There is no other traffic on the road so my journeys are uh, much quicker and so uh, actually I need to uh, to tweak them and, and shorten journey times. Uh, which is uh, great and uh, something we ought to be uh, celebrating at the moment. So um, I'm going to take you uh, all the way back to um, basics. Um, apologies to those of you um, that have got much more experience um, and have uh, lived and breathed um, real-time information for a long time. Um, uh, but uh, but the, the, we're going to go back to um, basics right to the start. So uh, if we start with a simple timetable, um, the simplest theoretical case, <coughs> and we'll add uh, complexity as we go along. Um, if you have, in the simplest case, a single bus running a single route, um, and it has a single trip um, and it's visiting bus stops that uh, only this trip visits, um, you can um, just take a timetable. In this case, we're just saying for simplicity purposes, um, it's, it visits a stop uh, every 10 minutes. Um, in reality, it's going to be uh, much more frequently than that, but it's easier on the brain and the maths um, to, to keep it nice and uh, separated and simple like that. If um, the timetable is perfect um, in, in a perfect world, um, there is no congestion. There's no pesky passengers getting on board or alighting to slow, slow the vehicle down. Um, and there's none of the real world challenges faced by an operator. You could actually just take the timetable that you've got um, and use that to, uh, to trigger um, countdown times. So the bus, uh, you can count down on a display uh, to when the bus is going to arrive and it's going to arrive exactly when it says in the timetable. Um, you don't need any more intelligence. Um, you don't need anything more clever um, than that. Um, however, um, the world is not quite uh, as simple as that and nice as that. Um, so um, if we take the example of um, some congestion, um, there's a load of delivery vans um, doing some deliveries just before the final stop. Um, then um, that's going to cause some congestion. And let's say it's going to delay the bus's arrival at the last stop um, by three minutes. Now, if you knew that was going to be there in advance, um, you could adjust your timetable so that uh, the timetable reflected those delays. Um, and that's what an operator would do um, with uh, regular known um, congestion that's consistent. You can plan for that in your timetable. Um, but reality is congestion is, is rarely as uh, predictable as we'd like. Um, and so in this example, um, the bus leaves um, the previous stop, it's 10 minutes till the next bus stop, and it trundles along quite happily. Um, and the signs counting down and at five minutes, the bus is all on track. Um, but just before it arrives at the, the next stop, 
uh, he gets caught up in, in this congestion and it gets delayed for three minutes. What happens if you've got no intelligence and, and no historical knowledge and you've not um, adjusted the timetable uh, is the bus arrives eventually um, at the bus stop uh, three minutes late. But the sign has counted down and said the bus is going to be here um, immediately. Um, and it's stuck at that for three minutes. So the customers stood there going, where's the bus? Um, it should be here by now. Um, and so what can we do about that problem? That's really where real-time information comes in. Um, and that's really what predictions um, and countdown times are really all about solving this uh, little problem. If we know about a uh, three minute delay because of these uh, delivery vans, then you could build it into your timetable so that rather than taking 10 minutes between stops, it's going to take 13 minutes between uh, the last two stops. Um, but we know that um, congestion is never consistent. It's always uh, varying. And so um, what we can do um, at the simplest level is assume and work out um, that there is often congestion in this um, bit of the road, so therefore we're going to build it into the timetable. Um, but what happens if one day there's no congestion? The bus is going to arrive at the bus stop uh, early and then it's going to have to wait or it's going to go past and, and customers arriving for the timetable time are going to miss the bus. Um, so we need to learn from um, not just what's happened in the past, but um, more up-to-date um, road conditions, um, speeds, and that sort of thing. We can't just rely on what's happened in the past because today might be different. Um, so you can learn from um, other vehicles on the road, other buses. They're simple. You might well have control of those in a more realistic scenario where you've got multiple buses going down on a stretch of road, either on the same bus service or, or a different one, um, potentially even a different bus operator. You might be able to, to get some intelligence on what's going on on the road network from traffic control. You might be able to find out uh, live road speeds, for example. Um, and you can then use that to help um, improve the accuracy of, of what you're telling customers. So in this example so far, we've just assumed that things are going to play by the timetable. Um, in reality, we know that's not the case. So what you actually need to do is rather than assuming where the bus is, you need to really know where the bus is. Um, so um, a key um, part of providing a countdown, providing real-time information is knowing where the bus is um, and being able to work out where it is according to the timetable. Um, and so we need to know the bus's current location. These days that's done using uh, GPS, same technology you use in a car for your sat nav, um, for example. Um, and the bus will typically uh, report back to uh, a back office on a regular basis. Um, that's normally at the moment every 30 seconds, although um, we're seeing more and more um, pay systems reporting in more frequently than th every 30 seconds. Um, and some places um, in other countries, they're providing position updates every couple of seconds, basically as fast as the GPS can tell the vehicle's moved, it's sending that position back. The more data you've got, um, the better you know where the bus is, and so therefore the more accurately you can predict how long it's going to take to 
uh, get to a bus stop because in reality, as you go along a bit of road, um, you might be going 30 miles an hour for a bit and then you slow down and you're going 20 miles an hour and you might speed up. Um, and so rather than having positions that are nicely evenly spaced uh, between a bus stop and uh, the next bus stop, that you're going to have bunching and stretched positions. Um, and so um, what you need to do um, is do a bit of maths, um, basic um, O-level uh, GCSE type maths. For those of you that are homeschooling, you've probably come across this um, recently. Um, a year ago, you probably um, had forgotten it, but, but basically you can work out how long it's going to take to, uh, to get to a point by um, looking at how long, uh, uh, how far away you are from that location and um, what speed you're expected to uh, take to get to that place. Um, so you can then work out the time. So uh, if you were going at 60 miles an hour um, and you're a mile away from um, the next bus stop, it would take you a minute to get there. Um, very simple calculation, but uh, real-time systems will be doing this um, for every bus, every time there's a position update. Um, so you can rapidly get into uh, significant numbers of uh, calculations. Um, just to make things more complicated, um, unfortunately, the road network is not all nice straight lines unless you're on uh, an old Roman road. Uh, they twist and turn, and so if you look um, just at um, the as the crow flies position of where the bus is and where the bus stop is, then you're going to get one distance, but the bus is going to travel um, normally further distance um, as it goes around those uh, those corners and bends. Um, and so what you really need to do to help improve the um, accuracy of your calculations by knowing how far the bus has got to travel more accurately um, is uh, information about the track that the vehicle is going to take. Um, typically, um, this would be using something like in, in the example on, on the screen, the OS master map highways network, but uh, OpenStreetMap have um, something similar. Um, as do uh, to Google and um, and here and, and, and other people. Um, and what they do is they break up the road into uh, different sections. Um, typically a section is the, the stretch of road until you get to another junction. So for example, the bus may be going along here and you might have a bus stop here before this junction and, and here. Um, Actually, that's traversing a bit of that section of road, that section of road, that section of road, and a bit of that. Um, but the advantage is, is with, with using tracks, is that this section of road, which goes around a corner, you, you will be provided with the length of that track. So you can do some uh, additions and you can work out, uh, actually, rather than the straight line distance, if you add up those uh, sectional lengths, you can get actually the, the road distance that the vehicle is going to need to travel. And that helps you uh, improve your predictions. So in this simple uh, example so far, um, where you've got a single vehicle going along a single route uh, within a, uh, a single um, trip, um, actually, all you need to know is um, the service and the line, the timetable, the track, uh, and the GPS. Um, and you only need to know the, the, the service or the line number because you're going to tell the customer that. Um, you could get away with just the timetable and the tracks and the GPS at the most basic level. But reality is, is that um, the world isn't that simple. You've got multiple bus routes and things like that. And we're going to come on to that next and, and start to build up um, the data. But to help improve the predictions, 
um, as we touched on before, you really need to, to add some history. And this is where your real-time prediction engine comes in because you're going to use a bit of the timetable. You know, the operator said it's going to take 10 minutes to get from this place to that place. Um, and you need to factor that in. You can then look at um, the recent past journeys along a stretch of road. You know, has that taken 10 minutes to get from A to B, that bus? Um, on the same service or other services running along the stretch of road, you might then well look at um, previous days. Now, what happened yesterday? What happened last week or what happened last month? Um, and uh, you might get even cleverer than that on the basis that uh, journey times on a Monday are different to a Friday um, and reflect that. And um, there's a few um engines out there that will go it's raining we know that journey times always get extended in the weather um either because more people are getting on or people have been more cautious driving so driving more slowly um and so um the cleverer your prediction engine the more history the more learning it's going to do about what's going on and what's happened in the past um and if you can get other feeds from a traffic management system, um, you might well be able to learn about road speed um, and do something um, about that um, and feed that in um, or um, look at um, feeds from um, Navtech or somebody like that or TomTom that's looking at GPS. Um, from from sat -navs and building up a wider picture of what's going on the road network. So um, in the simple world that we talked about so far, um, it's really easy um, to uh, know what journey um, is being run and to know what to display on a screen um, because actually you have no choices to make. Uh, however, the reality is um, it's never as simple as a single bus on a single trip. You have multiple buses, you have multiple routes, um, you've got multiple operators, all operating in a big uh, network environment. So you need to um, be able to identify um, what's going on. Um, and which bus service you're looking at. So um, typically, um, with the information that we've talked about so far in terms of service, at timetable, and knowing where the bus is, um, you start to have to guess when you've got a situation as simple as um, it's an out and back service, um, but you've got journeys that start at 10 o'clock at either end of the route. Um, how do you know which journey is being operated by which bus? Um, so you need to start to play in location. If you don't have any other um, things to, to to help the guess, um, you know, you look at well that bus is over there and that's close to the origin point, um, and so therefore uh, it's obviously that's journey, and then you make that guess. But the more vehicles you've got, the more trips you've got, the harder those guessing games become um, and the less likely you are to be able to uh, definitively say that bus is running that particular journey on that service and therefore I can create a prediction for it. <clears throat> to make life easier and to reduce the level of guessing, um, you really, um, in a real-time system, start to need to know other bits of information. You need to know the operator. You need to know the service that it's on. Um, and um, you need um, to know, um, ideally, something about the vehicle journey um, that's going on at, the, at that point. So ideally, the gold standard will be a vehicle journey reference. Um, it's unequivocal. It should be unique. 
so you don't have to guess. You can, as soon as you've got that, know that that vehicle is operating that trip um, and there's no guessing. Um, so far in the UK, there's been a lot of um, guessing and journey matching, which is why um, you don't see every single journey that a vehicle um, is operating having a prediction. Um, so we need to start to do something about that. Um, so, um, so far we've talked about looking at um, single journeys um, in isolation. In reality, um, a bus doesn't just do one journey a day, it does multiple journeys. Um, and so we're going to want to, to actually start to try and work out um, what a vehicle is going to do next so that we can predict cross journey uh, to improve customer information further. So if we have a journey that um, ends at a bus station at, at 10.30 um, and that same bus starts the ne its next journey at 10.40 from the bus station, um, then why do we need cross journey predictions? Why are they important? Well, um, if for ease we say actually there's more congestion um, and these delivery vehicles are really jammed up now um, and it's 12 minutes late arriving at the bus station, it's going to arrive at rather than um, at 10.30, it's going to arrive at 10.42. Um, the problem with that is that it's supposed to leave the bus station at 10.40. So that's time and the stops um, along its route, um, the times are going to be wrong um, because there's no way the bus can start its journey at 10.40. But you don't know that until um, the bus starts the journey late. And it's only at that point that you can start to provide real useful information to the customer. Um, but if you know what the, the incoming bus is doing next, and you know it's going to be doing that, you can go, actually, um, it's arriving 12 minutes late. It had a 10 minute stand period. Um, and so actually it's going to be at least two minutes late as it departs. And you can then cascade that information down the stops to the uh, to the next um, displays um, and journeys. And you can, you know, if you then know what the next journey is on after that one, you can cascade that further into the future. So to be able to um, provide that information about what's happening next to the vehicle, um, you need to know some operational data. Um, so typically that might be the running board or the driver duty, depending on, uh, on, on how the bus operator um, rosters things and, and, and runs its timetables. Um, and you would provide that um, in the timetable information in block number um, and um, ideally you would then also know things like ticket machine elements if, if that's how um, the drivers are signing in. Um, so there's, there's some uh, components in Trans Exchange that let you have that. Um, and um, if you want to be able to provide information um, and predictions for the first journey of the day or the first journey that the vehicle is going to make, you really want some dead run information. So that bit of a of that the, the, the bus makes when it's empty, when it's out of service between uh, a depot and um, its first stop or, um, if it's got a positioning run because it's finishing one journey in one location and starting the next journey somewhere else. Um, if you've got that, all of that sort of adds up to all of the guessing that you've done um, so far um, and avoids that and starts to help you provide information um, on what the bus is doing next. Because if you don't know that, you can't provide any form of prediction until you know that that journey has started. And as I said, 
if that's starting late, then you don't, uh, you can't provide information for at least the first few stops of the next journey to the customer. Um, so historically, um, a real-time system has has dealt with this data challenges by negotiating with operators for live data feeds individually. So you know, if you're in a if you're in a county and you've got four or five operators, you'd be negotiating with them separately. Um, you'll be needing to keep in regular contact with them to make sure you've always got the latest timetables and operational data in the system um, and keeping on top of all of that um, just to be able to provide accurate information. But what that also means is that um, if you're wanting to provide information to uh, public, um, you've got patchy access because has the app or the website that as the customer you're choosing to use got access to all of the data for the area. Um, if you're uh, a new entrant into the market, um, it's very expensive because you've got to negotiate all these feeds, keep on top of all of the data updates and things like that. Um, and so to, uh, to help overcome that, um, the Department of Transport um, set about a project, um, bus open data project to, uh, to try and um, overcome that um, and um, help make life easier for people. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Tess. Harwood from the BODS team um, now, but I can't see her on the list. Are you? Hello. With... Yes. All oh, right. Hello. Yes. Here yeah, I am. Hello. Welcome, Brilliant. Tess. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tim. That was that was really useful. Um, so I want to just talk to you all today a little bit about the Bus Open Data Service and what will be provided on that service. Um, currently and what's coming kind of over the future months as well. So if we could just go to the next slide, Tim, that would be great. So the bus open data service, there's really two sides to this. One side is a place for operators of local bus services to publish data. And the other side, which is designed for this sort of audience is the fine bus open data service where you can go and consume that data for free um, so BODS, it's an open data portal which provides three types of bus data. So uh, it provides timetables, AVL, which is your real time um, kind of aspect of it, and fares. And in terms of who does this include? So this includes um, in scope ev all bus operators in England. So anyone who has a registered bus service should be providing this data. Um, so in terms of who we're actually seeing on the service, it is a little bit more than that. So you can see on the diagram just in the center of the page, you've got kind of all of England, but also where we've uh, got into legislation, cross-border services, they've given us the full service for those as well. And you've got some voluntarily up in Scotland as well. We expect the voluntary side to, to only ever increase as more people start using the data and we start to see the benefits of it. But you know what? What was the plan? Why is this data being opened up? And the real, real aim of this is to improve passenger information um, and support developers of apps and services and real-time information to improve what's available out there. So for the passenger, just as Tim's been mentioning, it's about knowing what time the bus is actually going to arrive and also knowing how long that journey is going to take. Um, this is all part of the government's initiatives to uh, increase the amount of patronage by bus. It's it's really an important target for uh, kind of green green directioning and also uh, in terms of making sure we're providing a, a good service to the to the passengers. So, if we could just go to the to the next slide, we'll start to have a bit of a look around what you're going to find on bus open data. So uh, there are a few ways you can get your data depending what kind of consumer you are. So at the moment you can currently browse data sets published to the service. So you can look at those by data type. So timetables, 
um, AVL or FAIRS. You can also look per operator and also per status. So, for example, um, you know, if data might be currently published in the future, it might de be deactivated if it's no longer um, in date or for whatever reason. In terms of you can download static copies of all the data, including AVL data. So if, if this is all quite new to the user or to the consumer, we got uh, a, a static copy of AVL that will update every five seconds, but obviously that will just be a snapshot, but quite useful for development. Um, and then we also have an interactive API for those looking to, to pull data through the API with, you know, by data type and also you can use a range of query parameters. So uh, that's the way we'd really encourage people to start pulling this data because you can keep it up to date and also maintain it slightly easier from your end. If we could just go to the next slide, we can have a little bit more deeper dive into what data is actually on this and how does this kind of link with uh, what Tim's been telling us before. So of the kind of required data, you know, some of those things are things like service, line, the timetables, um, you know, vehicle journey reference. We're going to find all of that in the timetables data from BODS. Oh, sorry, a bus open day service, uh, also known uh, as BODS. So you're going to find that in the timetables and the actual data format is trans exchange. We're trying to uh, pin that down to a more specific version of trans exchange to improve, you know, the ability of people to use it. Um, so really up until summer, we're going to be allowing trans exchange 2.4 and 2.1, at which point there will be kind of a hard close where all the data should be coming in the same kind of exact same format in the PTI 1.1 profile. We also have FAIRS, so those looking to kind of incorporate FAIRS engines, uh, FAIRS data will be available. Um, and for real time, we've got the Siri VM bus location data. So they're the data types and that's how it's gonna link in. Bus location will obviously give you the GPS. Um, so it's a case of matching that bus location to the timetable to get your full real time view. Uh, yeah, life. let's have a little move on to the next slide. Awesome. So uh, just for those who are kind of being introduced to BODS and trying to understand a bit more about it and how to use it effectively, we have the concept of a data set on the service, which is effectively whatever the operator uploads to us or, or provides a link to us in a chunk, we call a data set. So one operator, so a big operator like first group, they'll just provide us one data set and one URL endpoint. That is the, the data set. But other operators, small operators tend to do one per line. Um, so just be aware of the data set concept. It doesn't just mean one timetable. It means a collection of timetables provided to the service. Um, to help with that, the unique identifier for each data set is the data set ID, which is unique across all data types. Um, so that should help to, to kind of direct you. Um, in terms of, it's quite important when using data to understand how it's updating. So when an operator provides data to the service, they can provide it through a URL if they have that capability, in which case, they can provide new data by updating the URL endpoint. And we'll scrape that every six hours to check if there are any changes and then provide automatic updates. You can also, they can also do manual updates so they can replace the data set with data set ID one with another data set and that will remain persistent as data set one or they can provide a new data set. So, um, that would just require them to publish a new data set with a new data set ID. In this case, we'd ideally like them to deactivate any old data sets, but we are still in training with a lot of uh, publishers. So um, that this might not be the case. And also we're really looking to get feedback from those using the data. So if you do see anything strange, um, it's really easy to leave that piece of feedback for an operator by identifying that data set ID you can go to browse for that specific data set, go find it, and then leave a comment for the operator so that they know um, how they can improve their data directly from the people who want to use their data. Um, so there's some kind of key some concepts about the bus open data service. If we just go to the, the kind of last remaining slide. 
um, we hope that from being able to get to find bus open data, you'll be able to kind of do and have everything that you need. But that's not to say you do already have everything you need and we can't help consumers more or provide different support or workshops. So if you do have any ideas, I'd really like to hear them. I'd really be welcoming to, to any kind of feedback you've got. Um, we have got a help desk for, for support queries and please do use that. And there will be upcoming kind of workshops and hackathons on a variety of topics, including real-time data, including um, the kinds of questions that Tim's talking about today. So please do keep an eye out for that uh, in the upcoming in the upcoming couple of months. Um, happy to for you to finish, Tim, or if there's anything else you'd like to cover that you think is important for the for the group here. Thanks. Um, no, I think that's been a useful uh, run through of, uh, of Bob's and, and what it covers. Um, so um, having heard about what is on BODS, um, how does that actually relate to um, what we've been hearing about um, earlier? So if we're going to use bus open data, um, if we look at some of the some of the requirements and expectations of the data, you can see perhaps and maybe start to understand why some of these things are being mandated and why some of the, the things in the trans exchange and the Siri documentation uh, for BODS um, are important because actually it's all about how can we match what's going on with the schedule and the timetable with what's happening in the um, in the location feed in, in the AVL. So uh, operator, we obviously need to know who that who is running a particular service. Um, we've got to be able to match that between Trans Exchange and Siri. Um, and given there is a national database of operator codes, um, national operator code is what NOC means, um, you should be using that because that actually then means you can um, match the data in affairs that you're providing. So if somebody was creating a journey planner using uh, bus open data, they can uh, match the operator with the timetable and provide the fares and provide a prediction. Um, line ref, um, so um, this needs to match again between Trans Exchange and Siri. Um, so we know we're talking about the same line um, and a line in these files is different to a service. You might have a service 23 and you might have um, underneath that a couple of different um, routes. You might have the full route and then you might have another one which goes off and, and goes around a twiddly bit of an estate at the end, but you might call those both 23. We need to, to know what you're calling the, the bit underneath that and those uh, different um, routes. Um, we need to know where it's starting and where it's ending. So the origin and destination, let's have that in NAPTAN, the ATCO code again, so we can match it up between different systems. Um, and so we can use that to help identify um, which uh, journey and which route it's, it's been run if we don't have some uh, something like vehicle journey reference. Um, as I say, um, that's, that's the gold standard. That's globally unique identifier. Um, if we've got a vehicle journey reference, we don't need to look anywhere else really when we're creating a prediction um, because we can instantly know um, what's journey uh, is being run and so we can do all of that matching um, without having to make any guesses. Um, and then um, vehicle ref and block ref, that's operational data um, that tells us um, what vehicle is, is running that particular journey um, and what its um, operation, what its running board is or its driving duty um, so that we can then uh, know what that vehicle is going to be doing um, in future 
um, so that we can start to create cross journey predictions. Um, so hopefully you can see now why some of those things are mandated um, because, and, and they say actually it's got to match what you're providing in your trans exchange or in your Siri because to be able to provide accurate, meaningful uh, information to the customer, we need as little guesswork in there as possible um, to be able to, to, to create as accurate information. Um, and so um, quick sample of Siri taken out of um, uh, BODS yesterday afternoon. Um, so uh, Brighton and Hove Bus Company, uh, go ahead group operator um, in this case. So that's the national operator code saying it's on line seven, um, saying this is its destination. So if we didn't have anything else, we could work out what trip it's on from a bit of guesswork. Um, we've got block refs, so we know what other journeys are using that block ref during the day so we can piece what the vehicle is doing together. We've got a vehicle journey ref unique in the data set so we can go straight to that um, journey and we know the times at all of the stops for that journey without any of the guesswork and we know that it's vehicle 836 so that we can then piece that together um, with the block ref to, to be able to see what's going on uh, in, in the future to provide uh, that quality information. And so um, that's a quick run through of um, what's a prediction, how do you create it, um, and um, why in bus open data um, the data sets are, are being asked for and, and some of the uh, some of the key um, reasons for joining things up. So um, opportunity for questions now there's there's a few that have come through in the in the in the chat i'm going to take them um in the order they've arrived are there any authorities operators flagging cancellations via on street real time to help passenger plan trips um there are outside of um bod's data so um as an example um off the top of my head um, people like NCT in Nottingham are doing it. First group in West Yorkshire, they're doing it in their systems. Um, whether that's being fed through into, into BODs, I'd have to investigate. Um, is this your own or commercially operated services? Um, so supply data into BODs, um, is a requirement if you're running a registered service. It doesn't matter whether that's um, a supported service um, or purely commercial or a combination. Um, and if you're an authority running a service um, using your own uh, operator and it's a registered service and you're taking uh, fares on the vehicle, then um, it's in scope. Um, are there plans to provide a Siri SM feed? Um, that's something that a few people have asked um, over the last couple of years. Um, there is a uh, GTFS real-time feed available now um, that BODS is providing. Um, Siri SM not for the time being, but um, uh, if there's the demand, then that's possible. Um, but you might be okay using um, the GTFS RT feed. Uh, David Batchelor from Ticketer makes a good point. Vehicle journey ref is the only item the driver doesn't know. Um, no, but a lot of, that's the unique best unique identifier um, and ought to be able to be um, worked out from the back office data. Um, otherwise, you end up with having system specific um, identifiers and start to, to get into complexities. But 
um, perhaps one to, to talk separately, David. Um, then where can we get all the details of the file formats, transit exchange tabs, API calls? Um, so if you go onto the bus open data site, it's quite well indexed by the search engines. Um, the um, profile document is there. The Siri profile um, documentation is there. Um, and um, if you register um, on BODs, you can get access to the API to, uh, to start to make live calls. Um, do we check operator reference before publishing Siri feed? Um, not codes in Siri don't really match not database of publishers. Um, so one of the things that's being developed at the moment is a whole suite of data quality and checking tools by the uh, Open Data Program. Um, up till now, um, it's been um, a bit of a case of let's have the data that you've got to try and get it um, as big and good a picture as possible. Um, over the next few months, it's a case of um, uh, starting to, uh, to to dig into the data and look at the quality issues and, and flag them up so that in the, by the summer, um, the data is, is all of the same quality or using the same profile um, in the system. Um, and um, NOC is, as David says, uh, mandated in the Siri um, profile. Um, uh, then we've got a... Um, um, yeah, um, one from uh, about NOC database, slightly confusing because different operators have a few different NOC codes available. Who's to say which is the correct one? Um, if, as an operator, you're not sure what your NOC code should be, get in contact with the uh, the BODS um, help desk, um, and they will help you uh, work out which you should be using for which services. Just quickly, um, on that note, if you do, if you don't know and you want to contact the help desk, it really helps to give the help desk some context. So. Give them, you know, if you're an operator, the name of the operator, if you're an agent, name agent, consumer, your name or your company's name and kind of any information you have. So license number, if you do have that, provide it and that will help them. Um, so, yeah, please do provide them with context. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yeah, been there a few times already. <laughs> yeah. um... Mark from EPM asks about retrospective data available. Um, it is for timetable data. Um, previous uh, timetables uh, are available as long as the, the end point is still there. For, for location data though, um, that's not being um, stored and made available. So you couldn't look back and, and look at the location data for last week, for example. Um, it will be a uh, very big data set that. Um, there's a, also GTFS position and schedule. Are these matched and including all operators? Um, so the GTFS data is being generated from the um, transit exchange and Siri data that's being provided. So if those data sets are there, there should be GTFS data set available. Um, and um, Sebastian asks, is it reliable to replace a Siri VM feed directly from a ticket machine back office with a Siri VM for BODs? Um, it's, it's as reliable as the feed going into BODs is, um, and, uh, and they're pretty reliable. You can tell um by looking at bods because it tells you whether the feed's live or not um so um it's almost certainly as reliable as you're going to get uh, direct um but if you're for example a real-time system provider you might be getting other information in your 
direct Siri VM feed that's not um, expected in the um, in the BODS feed. So it's worth just checking that the data that you need um, is is in that um, in the BODS feed, just to make sure. Um, understand how to scope at this stage, but any scope to try and link to patronage data in the future. Um, Tess, I've not heard anything no. about patronage data. Passenger occupancy in, in live is, is something that people are being encouraged to provide. Um, yeah, so I, I think, yeah, you're completely right, James, as you identified, there are some quite large hurdles in that area to cross. And I think um, realistically at this point, we really don't want to, to confuse the idea of occupancy and actual pass and patronage data. Um, the former being, you know, quite important during a public health crisis and something we're trying to encourage very, very hard to make sure we're all safe. Um, the latter being something which is obviously of complete interest to all of us, you know, are more people going to be taking the bus? And I think we will continue to collect that data in the usual ways um, through, um, you know, the, the various uh, organisations that do that. I think, you know, the future is the future. It depends what's important, I guess, but not at this point, no. Um, yeah. And in terms of latency, so um, the maximum latency that's acceptable is 30 seconds, but we're seeing latency usually much, much faster than that. So uh, it will depend on the provider and also, you know, some other factors. But, you know, we, ideally, we'd like to get it much closer to sort of five seconds. And that's what we're trying to encourage. But we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, I think Richard was um asking a slightly different question but that one is that so tess is talking about there about the the position update frequency so how, how often the bus um um provides its position um and uh, yeah if you can ramp up the, pos the 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 frequency of that the better the the processing latency um through through bods um, I don't know that um, Less than I've five seen seconds. any figures for that. So how long it takes data to get from the in input side of BODS to the uh, to being available in the API. Um, quick enough for you to rely on, I think, Richard. Um, and then um, John... Uh, Ulatin, seeing the figures with the coverage in the first slide, seems to be roots with shapes presented on the map. Do you plan on adding shapes into your data sets? So those that that map is is just by created by plotting the, the roots in the root data. Um, and so if that if the timetable trans exchange timetables include tracks, then you can plot that so it follows the road. Um, otherwise, that would be um, uh, stop to stop straight line if you were going to plot it. Um, but whether you include tracks or not is very much um, up to uh, the operator and their capabilities. Um, does the data integrate with the audience survey open data to present a bus location on a map tile? Um, that's that's one of the reasons why this is being made available so people can do that um, it's not part of the uh, of the bod service though okay um thank you for your uh questions um and hope that uh, you've enjoyed this afternoon's session um if there are uh, any further questions then please do feel free to uh, get in touch with uh, either Tess or myself um, will circulate these slides and make the recording available. Um, and if I can um, just do a, um, a bit of a uh, promo, our next uh, webinar um, on the 25th of February is going to be all about experiences from implementing passenger counting. 
Um, back at the start of the pandemic, there was a sudden um, rush to how do we provide um, vehicle loading to our customers? How do we tell people if they're going to be full or, or the bus is going to be full or not? Um, so there's been a lot of people doing a lot of work. So we're going to pick up on um, people's real experience and um, uh, hear from people that have been doing predictive um, work and putting it onto bus stop signs, for example, um, so that uh, you can uh, find out um, how to do it yourself. Um, so uh, thank you again. Thank you to Tess for um, uh, taking part and, and helping. Um, if you want to get in contact with uh, with me or Artig, the details are uh, on the screen. Um, and uh, thank you for um, listening and watching and hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.